Sean is also chair. Oh, we are co-chairs. Thank you for starting the recording. I assume that's that was Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Um, I am now chairing. So if you don't like hearing my voice, I'm sorry. Uh, but I will be talking and, and kind of helping facilitate these meetings a little bit and driving the conversation. Um, yay. Yay. I did it. Uh, yeah, so and, with that, and part of the part of the justification for this was, you know, when I first started chairing this, I was actually working in Moscow and then now I'm now I'm not. And so it felt like it was weird to have um, only one chair of the Oslo working group as someone who doesn't actually work in an Oslo. So I thought it'd be great. And Gary's been stepping up with the agendas and everything anyway. So it seems like a, it seems like a great fit. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to help. Because this is all. This is uh, this is a great working group uh, for chaos. I I generally attend this every time because I I think that it's worth pushing other meetings for. Uh, okay, so with that, let's uh, start on this first topic: chaos best practice guides. Uh, who published this one? Was this you, Don, or did somebody else put this in? Um, oh, no, that was me, actually. Um, so so I've been starting to think about how we need to put together some best practice guides for, for the chaos project. And when I say started to think about, that's really all I've done. I haven't really, I haven't really fully fleshed this out. But I wanted to bring it up in this meeting, because I suspect that a lot of you have best practices for using metrics internally, things that have worked for you, things that haven't. And so I was thinking maybe that if anyone was interested in kind of working with me on this, or if you maybe just had an idea of something that you've written either internally or externally that we could repurpose into a best practice guide, I just wanted to get people kind of thinking about that. And, and feel free to, to reach out to me if you have any, any ideas or any thoughts, um, even if you don't have something yourself, but a best practice guide you would like to have, that would be also that would be also good. And I'll, I'll, I'll put together a doc and start collecting some of these as well and start sharing it around so that we can all have a look at it. So at this point, it's really just kind of a thing to think to think about and, and reach out to me if you're interested in working on it with me. Super. And I think the idea of uh, things that would be nice to have, uh, questions that we might have about best practices are good to ask. Um, anyone in this group, have things that they would love to see from best practice guides from chaos. Don't have to say it right now, but I am giving you a moment going once, going twice. Oh, All I'll right. Chime in. Oh. I'll chime in. Okay. Yeah, I, I have not used any of the chaos metrics yet, uh, in part because I'm a little bit intimidated by the complexity of the tooling involved. And so the one page guide with estimates of time to spend uh, would be really helpful as an overview of the whole process. Doesn't have to explain the whole process, just like sizing for project size if I wanted to engage with this. Is this a one person one afternoon project or is this a team of two spending a week or is this a quarter or is this a year? Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Any others? Going once. Oh. I have one. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, that's why I say it. Yeah, no, I feel like I've been through a lot of cycles of exercises like this, and there seems to be an element where you have to revisit what you selected and why. Um, and sort of, I'm curious maybe this is maybe curiosity is not always the recipe for best practice, but like, is there, what's the appropriate cadence to revisit and change a metric? Cause I think it's, you might chosen to measure something for one thing, but then things change over time. But then if enough factors change in your organization, it's worth revisiting what you're measuring and why, um, and potentially changing that. So kind of like, I think it's similar to the question that was just asked around like kind of time commitment to actually implementing it, but it's also like, thinking about the life cycle of that metric and usage of your organization. And maybe you'll track it perpetually, but maybe you won't. Um, and so maybe discussing what those reasons for changing might be and kind of to be aware that this isn't a fixed exercise. Yeah, and kind of in maybe 
also in in general how do you how do you evolve your approach to metrics over time as you as you learn more about what's working for you and what's not that's a really good idea that's a nicer way of putting it because <laughs> that's what i'm talking about i'm just like trying to figure out how do i change things in a way that's still constructive yeah, I think the cadence is great because um, when you're getting started, it can be very intimidating uh, to like know when do I even care about this? Is this a one and done or is this a half yearly or yearly? And I, I've put in another little one that I had thought of, which is, uh, are there, is there like an event or a moment that can happen specifically in an OSPO that it makes sense to revisit what metrics we're using? Great. Those are some great starting points. Uh, leave another moment for anybody to chime in. Going once, going twice, gone. All right, moving on. Uh, please uh, get in touch with Don to get involved with that if you'd like to. So next thing, questions OSPOs have for chaos panel at OSSEU about understanding OSPO value. I guess that, that was also me. For someone who didn't wanna talk a lot in this meeting, I certainly added a lot of agenda items. Um, we, <laughs> so we, we have an OSPO panel at uh, OSSEU and we're in the process of putting together our list of questions for the panelists. So our, our thinking was it's a 40 minute session. We do like 20 minutes of prepared questions and then open it up to the audience for, for 20 minutes of, of Q and A for the panel. But we were curious because, um, we figured that a lot of people in this group will be either in the session or types of people who would be in the session. So we were curious if you had any any questions around OSPO value that you want to make sure that we cover in this panel or any any thoughts. I mean, I guess I have some. Uh, I I think it would be helpful to see like which of these um what's the word i'm looking for categories of metrics map to maturity models in ospos because there's certain metrics that i think um well maturity model is also something that we're trying to walk away from as a top as a term because it's not that an ospo is more mature because it has specific focuses right but i think that there might be some overlap of how to do thinks about an OSPO in terms of what uh, categories of concern it might have uh, mapped to what metrics chaos provides that might also overlap with those concerns. Because as I understand, it's not like a one-to-one -one mapping of OSPOs think about this and chaos tracks this. It's like there are going to be some metrics that kind of might be surprising in how they contribute that value. Those would be um, helpful to, to create some conversation and mapping around as far as like a specific way to ask that question, I'll get back to you. Sounds good. Anyone else have uh, questions burning in their mind now? Not something we have to do again right this second, but would be happy to. Oh boy, go ahead, Ed. Thanks. Um, I guess this is another... Um sizing question. Um, I know that OSPOs range in size from one person doing a role part-time all the way up to much larger. Um, as an organ as working within an organization that's yet to hire an OSPO lead, um, I'm just sort of wondering uh, for the panel or for the group, you know, what size an OSPO organization is has proven to be successful and how how much resources do you need, especially in a time of challenging resource commitments to successfully pull it off? And I know that answer is gonna vary hugely, but it's like, a, you know, again, it's the, is this a one person, one, one afternoon a week job? Is every, does every OSPO need a committee of 12 and a, seat on the board of directors and then like somewhere in between. Yeah, and I think a uh, panel is probably the right place to ask that because you'll get a lot of different answers from different folks on the panel. Yep, expect that. 
if I'm allowed. I think that uh, is really important to also define um, OSPO for how big the company should be. Because we are talking, if we are talking about uh, an OSPO for a company that has hundreds of uh, employees, then probably the things are different than a corporation that uh, is spawn across across all continents. You are very much allowed. Thank you for saying uh, what you what was on your mind, and I think yeah, knowing how big the OSPO should be based on the surrounding organization. Um, feels like could kind of fit in the chaos uh, model. It's and how much they engage with OSS is a good one. Um, so yeah, those are those are good questions. Anyone else? Uh, I guess I would suggest one on measuring their own impact as an OSPO. What do they bring to the org and how do they, I don't want to say justify their existence, but I know that's kind of coming under increasing pressure with the contraction of the market. So it's, there's always kind of a question to demonstrate value and that can very much align to all the things that we've already discussed in terms of say what um, areas that they, or functions they provide or how, what the relationship is to the rest of the business. But I think many would appreciate thoughts on how to ensure that their work is valued and is understood in context that the business can understand. Yeah, that's, Absolutely. Super, that's super important. Okay, stellar applause, wild applause. Uh, Thank you all for engaging, uh, giving some questions here. Please uh, make sure, and is this a submission form here? Or is this just the talk uh, link? Okay. This is the talk link. Yeah, this it's just, just the, the abstract. Link. Yeah, cool. it's the abstract to give you an idea of what we submitted. Super. I will watch virtually and um, know whenever you're feeling um, uh, awkward up on stage that I am clapping behind my my screen. Uh, fantastic. Any other input, any other questions, um, feel free to come back here and put them in later. But before we move on, going once, going twice, gone. All right, OSPO functions and a to-do book chapter. That's me. So Take this away. is, yeah. So this is something that we've been talking about in this group with respect to uh, the different functions um, as to how the OSPO can kind of play a role within the organization. Uh, these may be uh, imperfect, but I think this is kind of where we're settling right now. Um, the idea, right, is to continue to use these functions to identify metrics that could support uh, these functions. And so the first process is kind of identifying what some of these top level categories might be. This is also, I, I think, a potential framework that we could use for the to-do book chapter. So we've been asked by Anna to write a book chapter around metrics that can be uh, meaningful within an OSPO and how they can um, kind of support uh, practices within the organization. So I had a, a couple questions as I was kind of putting this together. Um, and so the first one feels like a silly question to this group, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So, um, so the first is, I think one of the things that would be kind of important for a book chapter, is if we work with these functions, and th this might evolve over time, that we can kind of define like why our concerns about internal adoption of open source software is important or why education around open source software is important or why engagement with open source communities is important and so on and so forth down, down, the, down the list. And so the first question that I'm asking is kind of around this first um, function, which is internal adoption. So just be like a, a sentence or two in a book chapter as to why the adoption of open source software within an organization is something that matters to an OSPO. Again, I feel a little silly asking this question to this group here, <laughs> uh, 
Um, but I'm going to ask it nonetheless, just so uh, I can kind of hear what you all have to say so that we can put those words from this expert group of folks into a chapter as to why this matters. And again, these chapters are not always going to be read by folks with, you know, large and really well-developed OSPOs. They may be uh, also read by people who are just starting to think about OSPOs as part of their organizations. So if, if people could just kind of talk a little bit about why observing the adoption of, of open source software within your organization is something that matters to an OSPO, it'd be really helpful for me here as I just write a few sentences. So why do you care about the use of open like, like, software? So are you actually wanted to answer it now? Yeah, if you just have a few oh. like, reasons why this is an important thing for you within your company. I mean, I think I think the answer to this is going to vary a lot and it's a really good place to start a conversation because Great. it's sort of the baseline. Like I can imagine that some places would say um, the adoption of open source is critical for like, because we're an open source company that like, um, like I'm thinking about some places I've worked at before. Um, we were, in, we built from open source and we contributed back to open source. And so both who we were hiring, who we were um, uh, uh, selling our products to were other open source developers. Like we were an entire open source ecosystem and building a business from that. Um, where I think where, where, where I sit now, like, I mean, the kind of flexibility to build our own tooling, um, I think it encourages us to use open source because there's a lot more choices that are available to us in building like our, our product um, architectures. I, I, like just somewhat, I think a slightly different reason why we would, we we use open source. Maybe not slightly different, but still different. That's great. Uh, thank you. Uh, I I think I'm I'm gonna take this. I want to make sure that the direction that I'm thinking about this is the same as what you're asking. That. Uh, it's presumed that most software organizations use open source, right? And this question isn't necessarily about why do you care? Like, why would you, why are you yeah. fueling adoption? It's our, presumed that yes. adoption is happening. Our yes. lawyers tried to get rid of open source software on our campus, and it took about two weeks for them to figure out that was completely impossible. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's worth um, putting as it's part of the framing of this question that like, almost every software organization for survival purposes has to, or almost every technology organization for survival purposes has to adopt open source. Um, because that's like part of why I think we care is because you have to have it uh, as, as a highly regulated entity. Uh, we at Verizon care a lot about doing it in a way that's not violating any legal compliance situations we care about ensuring that customer data and, and partner data isn't being compromised by vulnerabilities. Um, we want to make sure that the longevity of the software is going to fit our needs for uh, things that have to sit in people's houses and have very sparse updates over the course of multiple years. Like there's, um, there, there's a lot of like assurance, uh, like risk tracking that happens there, right? To use the term from risk working group. Uh, we care a lot about making sure that the risk is We, we like to be used that way. <laughs> yeah, I want to agree with everything Gary is saying. Another thing that I think uh, Gary pointed really nicely is the fact that uh, we are talking about open source, but not only in software organizations. We are talking about uh, technology organizations because there is also open source hardware and it will get more and more visibility. Mm -hmm. That's that's great call out because that's becoming more and more um, important. 
And then there's AI modeling, if you want to go there. <laughs> open AI, right? Open uh, LLMs and things like that. Yeah, open to some point. Yeah. Do we have a working group about that? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, I... Yeah, that's, I think I covered what I, I think is most important um, about uh, why we care and why we okay. this try is to great. track adoption. Yeah, no, this is this is really great. Um, other, other thoughts from folks? This will really kind of help me, you know, um, in a book chapter, kind of a frame what this can mean for people. Mm -hmm. um, other thoughts from people? Okay. Uh, thank you for that. So then, so if I was to, to um, come back to this, and if I, you know, I kind of focus in on the internal adoption and the discovery, I'm just looking at this one slide for, for the moment. We have this goal of, of kind of highlighting discovery of OSS within the organization. And from there, we can begin to ask questions. Uh, once we can kind of see the landscape of open source within the company, um, we can ask questions against that. So one of the questions, and only then can we begin to kind of build the metrics or metric models that can help answer some of these questions. So one of the questions that I do have for people as well is, all right, so you, you want to track these things. You want to be able to observe the open source. How how in the world do you go about discovering the open source that's in your company? How do you inventory that? <laughs> and I honestly, I looked online quite a bit for trying to find ways. So it, it kind of has to be done, doesn't it? Or do you not track, you, you, not maybe not the entirety, but some part of it? <laughs> You have to have some visibility into it. I, I really struggle with this question. I see Don shaking her head no. So then how do you <laughs> ask questions against that? Like, how do you? How I have do an I idea for you, Matt. Oh, I'm sorry. I see it has his hand raised. Oh, go, go ahead. I'll take it next. OK, um, mostly because I, I was going to discuss it in reference to your prior question. Because when, when I think about why we're tracking adoption of open source inside the company, I just see it as sort of a a required operational function. <laughs> like it's it's just how multiple engineering teams and efforts come together to co-build technology inside a company and as part of a product of a company. So it's, it's very much as an operational function that is required if you are doing this because there are so many different considerations that have already been listed out above. Um, and so when it comes to something like what you go, how do you go about discovering this, it's really about setting up processes that allow for the discovery as part of the process as, as you would for any other code tracking system or ingestion tracking system that you have in your company. So it's about building those processes, tooling and infrastructure to understand how you interact with open source as it relates to the rest of your code based technology infrastructure, whatever kinds of open source components you're using. So I see it very much as sort of a policy and process function um, that would enable you to track something like this. And I can speak to how our company is doing this, but I know it's not necessarily how other companies approach this. Can you talk a little bit about that? How you are doing it? And I know that it won't be universal, I agree. Um, yeah, we just, you have to go through an import process. Um, and so you log what, what you import and when, and then we have that version inside the company, but it's also because our company is built on a monorepo. So because of that, mm. we, we have to separate out anything that is not our own, just from a perspective of ensuring IP and correct um, participation engagement usage of that IP. Um, and so we have to ensure that open source is in its own bucket um, that relates to something that we don't own. and has other considerations for what we can do with it and how often. Um, but by putting it in a separate bucket, then we have a bucket that we can audit and understand who's using what and when.
I can take it next. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully I got that right, Sophia. I can fix what I what I didn't get right. Yeah, Ed. Yeah, so um I I would I would say that the the drive for discovery of what's going on with open source can come from a couple directions. Um, I've seen it come from InfoSec land, uh, where the the uh, people worried about uh, whether there are vulnerabilities uh, that have been discovered that could be exploited. Um, they want to have visibility into the code base so that they can understand uh, mitigation and upgrade strategy. So that's one vector. There's a vector coming from legal where there is a policy and compliance standpoint. That's definitely there. There's a vector from engineering where you want to make sure that you're using code that meets your engineering standards, whatever those might be, and maybe avoid using some code or types of code that are um, that are known by the experienced people in the group to be like dangerous at scale or or whatever the whatever the reasons are. So I think it's coming from it's coming from multiple sides, the desire for inventories and for auditability and for tracing. I I have to mention the word SBOM as one possible thing that you might draw from, but most software development tools have some sort of dependency discovery thing built into them that can be imported. And I don't alas, I don't know the name of the the global tooling, but basically you're scooping up data from your repositories, ingesting them into a database of some sort, and then making decisions from there. Okay, thanks. And again, if I didn't get all your points, feel free to add them to the notes. Um, Don, you were next. You were the yeah, I mean, I think... know, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, there, there are some cases where this is uh, a lot easier, so right, so like, um, it's easier to know what open source components are in your products because you have to track that because you have to comply with the licenses. So from like that standpoint, um, having an inventory of that is relatively relatively straightforward um, because you can just require that before a product ships. But I think, I think the place where this is a lot harder is when you're looking at um, individual developer environments and um, infrastructure across your company, you, you really, really don't have a lot of control over what a sysadmin installs on a on a box somewhere and uses it to run something that the, the company needs and then the same thing with like developer environment so you know nobody nobody really looks at what i install on my opens what open source software i install on my machine using my own personal development environment so there are a lot of areas that you really just um can't necessarily get that that kind of information you know this it goes back to like, you know, the early 2000s, we would have this conversation with, with companies. They'd be like, yeah, we don't have any open source at all. And, you know, and you're like, well, I bet you've got DNS fine somewhere, uh, you know, mapping IP addresses. And there's like all this like critical infrastructure that's open source that people just have. And then they don't even realize that they have it or that they're just using it. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, yeah. Uh, anything else? Uh, anything else? Don, let's call you Elizabeth. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I called you Brian for how many years we worked together? Like so, two. Yeah, it, at least it was literally so like two I, years. I don't. It was like a mental <laughs> thing, and so yeah, you get a free pass. I'm the worst offender of all time. Uh, yeah, Gary. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to use my my hands up privilege to to mention that uh, Christine asked a question in the chat oh, that I, oh bye Christine your question oh no here it is um, there's a question in the chat of do you see companies clamping down on things like sysadmin privileges to ensure people don't op install open source tools locally I think I can hang on to my my response to you uh, Matt long enough that we can kind of dive into that question if anybody has responses uh, I have responses. Oh my God, I have responses. That is that is super hard. They actually tried to do that at the company I work for, and there was a developer revolt, and they backed off of it. 
because developers <laughs> kind of need to install stuff in order to be able to do their job. And if you tell them that they can't install anything, um, it was it was not pretty. And they, okay. they eventually backed away from it. But we're not in a highly regulated industry, right? Yeah. I, look, I work for tech companies and that's that's kind of a, it's a different ball game, I think. They, they tried that in our computer science department and mm -hmm. the, we wrote a four page letter explaining why this wouldn't work and mm -hmm. sent it to everyone at the top. And it was unanimously agreed to. Now, if you can imagine how difficult it is to get a computer science department to unanimously agree on anything, mm. they agreed on that. Mm. Good, to, good to know, because I don't know if some companies due to like s bombs and stuff that at least are coming in from the US government are going to turn tech companies into sort of pseudo highly, highly regulated industries. <laughs> yeah. I, I do feel like I we're, we operate that like that already just because of all the regulatory things that we have to comply with, in which mm -hmm. case you have a policy, but then you also have an exception policy because not everything will meet everyone's needs, especially if you think about all the variety of things you have to test your unreleased code against and all those things may or may not be in that approved bucket uh, of things that we can use internally. So I think it's one of those things where I think there is definitely a push from some companies to have this locked down, but you have to have an exception process because it's it's going to restrict what you can do. And then that was holding your company back in other ways. Right. It's a really good question, Christine. Um, OK, so I, I wanted to like respond, I think, a little more like specific strategically to the question that you posed, Matt, about um, discovering the open source, because I think that uh, we gen or I've generally seen that there's a there's a response from InfoSec and from legal and from engineering and then establishing these processes and buckets where you want to restrict what code is coming in at a certain point. And you might do that by requiring that production infrastructure always pulls from like a internal um, hosting surface or they're using some cloud-based service to uh, push only the artifacts that can make it to production so that there's a little bit more of a secure supply chain. Uh, there's the other end of uh, all the way from the integrated developer environment. Uh, there can be restrictions before code gets pushed up into the internal code repository of, no, you can't use this one because it's not approved, or you can use this other one because it is approved. Uh, there's a cataloging that goes on there. There's um, the secure code analysis and SAST uh, for anybody who remembers what that acronym is, it's like there's SCA software uh, composition analysis that gives you that like SBOM and that list of dependencies that you can do. But then there's the other way of like doing just on the static code uh, instead of looking at it when it's being built. There's a lot of different approaches that you want to create that catalog, but then there's also keeping the catalog updated and what policies do you create on top of the catalog? I think that um, discovering where it is can take pretty much any one of those approaches where you start on the developer environment or you start on what people are pulling into production or you start on what's in the code bases right now or you start on you have to catalog it when you're integrating new code. Um, it, it's a it, There's not really a good standardized approach. I don't think there's a good one size fits all for it. Agreed. I think one of the things that I am hearing on is kind of the integration into existing processes within an organization can be a place to look. Right. Um, I'll just kind of say we've had a fairly similar conversation with respect to open source at a university. And it was kind of the same, same thing. Like we can ask, there's certain spots where we could ask about the open source that's being used by say faculty members. Um, but actually trying to get down to the individual level, like you were pointing out, Don, like we, we just can't, we can't ever really know what's happening inside of an office, for example. Um, but there are certain areas where we do have processes in place where we ask questions about software for certain things that we do. And it might be in those places where we could at least have some discovery. It'll be a, a small slice of the pie as to the overall open source that's in an organization. Um, but it'll at least provide us insight into it, a, a, a narrow part. And so kind of what I'm hearing is that you can attach 
potentially attached to some of those processes, whether it's open source inbound to the organization um, and asking questions on, on inbound and say check-in or things like if it's in a product, <laughs> asking questions against that product before it leaves an organization. So this is really helpful. So thank you for that. Awesome. Uh, thanks everybody for the lively discussion as we've been doing so far. So we shall continue. Chaos cast uh, seems like an idea that might interest this group. We're sourcing oh. ideas from here. Yeah, so this is me again. So, um, so part of chaos cast, um, one of the things that we had talked about, I don't remember where, maybe in the community call was having, do you remember in this group, I think, I don't remember, was it a, you, Alyssa, that had asked about people's uh, response to one of the most recent LF reports? Do you remember that? Do you remember when we had this discussion? Maybe. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a two weeks or a month ago. It was um it was a the report on maintainers LF report on maintainers. Do you remember this? Uh yes. Do you, I mean I remember the report and us having a conversation about it. Did I, did we have? Maybe a, it was Gary that brought it up. I don't know who brought it up. Somebody brought it up and brought up <laughs> chaos cast specifically. No no no. Brought up the report. They were like oh no yeah I brought up. Yeah, I brought up the report. I have the link. Do you need the link? No, no, no. So oh. and we had a really we had a really interesting conversation in this group just about the report and people who had read the report and kind of your your thoughts on the report. So one of the ideas we had for yes. Chaos Cast, it was just a really great conversation. And so one of Agreed. the ideas we had for Chaos Cast was um, either an existing LF report or new reports that might come out we ask a few people to kind of read the report and join a chaos cast to kind of almost have a discussion similar to what we had here to just give their feedback on how they understood the report, um, how they think the report might be meaningful. I think that's great. I, I would extend it. I have no idea what, exactly what you're thinking, but it doesn't have to be just LF reports because sure. I think it would be really interesting to get an assignment to actually read one of the pap like the papers that you know, like it would be really interesting to to Agreed. talk about some of these papers with, with with the range of experience and background here. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, totally agreed. Um, and it, I think it would be really, I think whether it's a report or a paper, it's like a book, a book club. Here, yeah, is, that was actually where this conversation club. came from. Yeah, we could we could localize it to a podcast. Um, and I, I you know, it, as for example, if it was like a if it was an LF report. I think a lot of people would probably be really interested in kind of listening to what folks say from from this community thought of the report and kind of it would be a nice synthesis of kind of what was in the document and just people's reactions. So I, I just it was kind of that idea, the book club book club from from uh, from our community call as well as the discussion that we had on the report maybe two weeks or four weeks ago whenever that was kind of coming together. It was just a really it was a really great idea and I think. I don't remember who had the, the idea. Was it Mary Blessing? I think who was on this call had this idea to do this um, as, as a chaos cast. So more to come on that. I just wanted to put that out there. For people. Yeah. Yeah. And then just uh, to add to that, we're sort of rebooting chaos cast. So we haven't done an episode in eight or nine months. And so we're, we're starting it up again. And so the idea is to do one episode that's kind of around, um, you know, what's, what's, what's new in chaos that's been happening uh, since the last podcast. Um, I would actually like to talk about that maintainer report. I think that would be a really good topic to have. Um, but in general, if you have other ideas for things we should be talking about in the chaos cast podcast, go ahead and add those to the planning doc. There's just a random ideas section at the bottom. So, so feel free to add ideas and add your name. So I know who added it. So I know who to talk to, but I, I'd love to have ideas from this group in particular. All righty, uh, Chaos Cast, the, the return of chaos. Uh, moving on, we have free and discounted tickets to all things open and everyone is eligible. So let Elizabeth know if you're interested. Yep, that's it. <laughs> right. Woohoo! And yeah. 
All right. Uh, and then at the very end here, coming in five minutes under, uh, reminder to complete our very short survey to help us understand what challenges you face using chaos tools and metrics so that uh, they can be improved. I believe this is from Don. Anything to add, Don? Nope, that's the gist of it. Fantastic. Love to have your feedback. All right, please fill that out. Very helpful, awesome stuff. Uh, this has been a great OSPO working group meeting. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to ask, say, or plead before we cut? I'll be on vacation during the next meeting. So if you want to run the next one too, that'd be fab. Oh no, is that on the 7th? <laughs> Possibly. We, uh -oh. we can chat offline. If, if you're not available, we'll find somebody else. It's not, it's not a All right. Deal. We, so we might send work me a out. DM. All right, we'll talk about it. Thanks, cool. everybody. Uh, have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you again next time. Thanks, Thanks Jennifer. Okay, bye. Right. bye everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.